For NAD test number seven, I decided to go away from the de novo NAD synthesis pathway and go back to the salvage pathway, where for two of the seven tests, I used NMN. But instead of using NMN for this test, I decided to use NA, or nicotinic acid, a form of niacin, as a means for increasing NAD. So for this test, did 600 milligrams per day of niacin impact NAD? And to assess that, I sent blood to Ginfinity for analysis, and if you want to measure your own NAD levels, discount link in the video's description. All right, jumping right into it, my NAD level was 67.4 uh, micromolar, which is my highest NAD level yet. So that raises a few questions. How does this test compare with earlier tests? Why did I decide to use niacin? And then is 67 micromolar high enough? So first, how does this test, 67 micromolar, compare with earlier tests? And what we're gonna see here is my NAD journey. This is from January to July of 2023, seven tests. For the first test, my baseline, this was without NR, NMN, niacin, B6, grapeseed as a source of paranthocyanidins, none of that, just my baseline, 25.6 micromolar. So then I took 300 milligrams per day of NMN and it didn't move my NED levels at all, essentially the same 25.3 micromolar. So then thinking the dose wasn't high enough, I decided to go with 1,000 milligrams per day of NMN and that finally raised my NED levels to 39 micromolar. So then I thought, well, I haven't really identified or addressed the root of the problem, why NAD is low in the first place. So then I shifted my attention to the de novo NAD synthesis path pathway, as I showed on the earlier slide, where I did three experiments. The first was uh, B6, adding more supplemental uh, B6, because as I showed in an earlier video, there's an age-related decrease for B6, and if B6 levels are low, you can't convert or you can't efficiently convert tryptophan into NAD. So increasing my B6 intake by about 3.5 fold, moved the needle in the right direction, 30 micromolar. But as we saw in the next test after that, and with a higher B6 dose, it, the B6 didn't impact my NAD. The average over those two tests, 26 micromolar, essentially close to my baseline. And that's with up to a 12 fold increase for vitamin B6. So then thinking that the age related block may be with quinolinate or converting quinolinate into NAD, I then used grapeseed powder as a source of proanthocyanidins, which have been shown to increase NAD in rats and mice. But for me, that didn't work at all. As you can see, my NAD levels were their lowest or the lowest that they've been over those six tests, 19.9 micromolar, which then brings us to niacin. So I returned to the salvage pathway because I wanted to go away from the de novo pathway because that didn't work. And I wanted to go to get actually improvement. I wanted to see improvement and knowing that NMN improved my data uh, I wanted to try niacin to see it, how that would react. And there's more on why I decided to go with niacin in a minute. So we can see that using niacin, I got my highest reading yet of 67 micromolar. So then why niacin? And I'm not going to focus on niacin versus NMN or NR, only focusing on niacin's potential strengths and as they apply to me. So in this study that was published in 2020, it was shown that niacin cures NED deficiency, and this was both in controls and in people who had adult onset mitochondrial myopathy. And that's what we can see here. So on the y-axis, we've got whole blood levels of NAD plotted against time. And this was a 10-month study with uh, blood sent for NAD analysis at the four and 10-month time point. Uh, the study included controls, they were, and this is a relatively small study of uh, 10 controls and five patients with an average age of 50 to 51 years. So then both were fed 1,000 uh, milligrams of niacin per day. And for both groups, we can see that there was a five to six fold increase for circulating levels of NAD. Now, any niacin increased NADP, which is NAD, but with a phosphate group added, it also increased NADP too. And that's what we can see here, NADP levels on the y-axis and again, plotted against time. And this time only in, in the controls, there was a significant 20% increase for NADP levels. So why is NADP important? Why am I hi highlighting this? Why do I care about NADP? NADP is important because to produce DHEA from cholesterol, it requires NADPH or the reduced version of NADP. And that's what we'll see here. So starting with cholesterol, cholesterol is converted by five enzymatic steps as shown in blue into DHEA or dehydroepiandrosterone. And then, and then note that DHEA sulfation, so adding a sulfur group to DHEA produces DHEA sulfate. So the importance of DHEA sulfate 
is that besides being the most abundant androgen in men, its levels decline during aging and relatively low levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And I won't go over that data in this video because I covered it in an earlier video. So if you're interested, it'll be in the right corner. Now also note that as a cofactor in each of these five reactions as shown in red is NADPH. In other words, if NAD is low, NADP would probably also be low and if NADP is low, the conversion of cholesterol into DHEA will be inefficient, potentially resulting in a low DHEA sulfate level. Now, in support of that hypothesis, when con considering my NAD levels have been low, my DHEA sulfate levels have indeed declined during aging. And that's what we'll see here. So I had two tests in 2005, and over those two tests, my average DHEA sulfate was 300 micromolar. And then note that over the past 23 tests over the last year, most of those with Cyfox, but the last seven or so using venipuncture, we can see that my average DHEA sulfate level is 117 micrograms per deciliter, which is low based on age-related changes and all-cause mortality risk. Now, for this most recent blood test, my DHEA sulfate levels weren't any better, 114 micrograms per deciliter, even though NAD increased from 25 to 67 micromolar, which then raises the question, you know, for the next NAD test, if I increase NAD further, will I finally get an increase for DHEA sulfate? Now, if that's not the case, I can pretty much cross off that it's NAD as a limiting factor uh, for having low, relatively low levels of DHEA sulfate. And then I can go back to focusing on either raising blood levels of cholesterol. Maybe it's possible that I have too low levels for blood levels of cholesterol. So less of that is being converted into DHEA sulfate or I may have a problem sulf with sulfation and converting DHEA into DHEA sulfate. So you, doing the NAD uh, testing can help me clarify aspects of that hypothesis. All right, so to raise NAD, will I just go higher for niacin, just increasing it above 600 milligrams per day? So for at least one more test, in contrast, I'll return to the de novo NAD synthesis pathway as shown here. So why, why will I do that? So I mentioned earlier that up to 12 times higher uh, for vitamin B6, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, P5P, had no effect on NAD. That suggests in my case, I may not have an age-related block there. Similarly, when I use grapeseed powder as a source of proanthocyanidins, that didn't impact my NAD levels either. In fact, it actually reduced my NAD levels uh, when compared with my baseline. So when considering that I may not have an age-related block at B6 or convert in converting quinolinic, uh, quinolinic acid into NAD, Maybe there are no age-related blocks in my de, de novo NAD synthesis pathway. Now to test that, if I supplement with tryptophan, I could end up raising NAD. Now my current tryptophan intake is one gram per day, and that data is provided by Chronometer. There will also be a discount link in the video's description if you want to track your own diet using Chronometer. So when considering my current intake is one gram per day, for the next test, NAD test, I'll supplement with an additional one gram per day, so I'll double my current tryptophan dose while not changing the niacin dose. So one gram of tryptophan plus another 600 of uh, niacin, and we'll see if I'm able to further increase NAD and potentially increase a, a DHEA sulfate. So I sent blood for analysis yesterday, so this the results should be in in the next week or so, so stay tuned for that data in a future video. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for at-home metabolomics, NAD quantification, green tea, epigenetic testing, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing with CyFox Health, which note that their panel of biomarkers is almost exclusively different from the at-home metabolomics, and it also includes ApoB, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. Hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.